He is risen. He is risen. Wow, Resurrection Sunday comes with hope. Resurrection Sunday comes with assurance. Resurrection Sunday brings with it some kind of peace because of the events that had happened just before. And so today we are talking about giving the spirit and peace because this month we've been talking about giving. Of course, we'll be talking about giving the spirit, the third person of Trinity, but also giving of peace. Well, two artists set out to make a picture representing what they could term as perfect peace. They first painted a canvas depicting a boy that was almost like carefree, sitting in a boat on a little lake without any ripple, without any waves to disturb the surface. And that to him was the understanding of peace. The other painter painted a raging waterfall with winds whipping and ravaging the surrounding that was spraying about. But as he painted, there was a branch that was protruding. And on that branch, a bird had built its nest and sat perfectly, peacefully, brooding over her eggs. Here, the bird was safe from her predatory enemies, shielded and protected by the roaring falls. So if you prefer, the first one must have been something close to a stagnation. And the second one really depicts that picture of peace, that in the midst of the raging waters, in the midst of sometimes competing interests in the world, there can be some tranquility, there can be some peace. For in peace, there are two elements, tranquility and energy. Silence and turbulence, creation and sometimes destruction. Fearfulness and fearlessness, said Dr. Han. Daniel C. Arakia Jr. says this. Peace, the word peace together with its derivatives. Verbs meaning to reconcile, to be at peace, and to make peace is one of those terms which more often than not is translated and there is an agreement that in many translations it is nearly the same. Meaning that peace will be translated with the same word most of the time, if not all of the time. In the Old Testament, peace primarily refers to the wholeness total health, and total welfare. And so you hear of shalom. And that total welfare, total health, and total wholeness, covering the sum total of God's blessings to a person who belongs to God and to a person who belongs to the community of faith. The term peace used in the New Testament is used in at least five different ways. Number one is that it can be the absence of war or the absence of chaos. Number two, peace as a right relationship with God or with Jesus Christ. Number three is that peace as a good relationship amongst people. Number four is that peace as an individual virtue or a state that is tranquility or even serenity. And number five is at peace 
as a part of a greeting formula. And so you may hear, peace be with you and also be with you. The Old Testament anticipated and the New Testament confirmed that God's peace will be mediated through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If you go to the book of Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 to 7 or even Micah chapter 5 verse 4 to 5. Peace with God came through the death and the resurrection that we celebrate now. The resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. No wonder Peter declaring to Cornelius says this. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel telling the good news of peace through Jesus Christ who indeed is Lord of all. And that is in Acts chapter 10 verse 36. Of course, we look at this topic today in the context of Resurrection Sunday. Jesus had just been put to death two or three days before by the authorities of the day. And they thought that they had dealt him the final blow. This was a time of deep grief and pain. The one that the disciples had put their faith and their trust in was now no more. The people around the disciples must have been ridiculing them. They must have been asking themselves, how do we move on from here? We left everything to follow Jesus. We left even our livelihood to follow Jesus. Some may have even left their families to follow Jesus. And this Jesus that they were following was now no more. This was a time of despair. This was a time of distress. This was a time of discouragement. In that confusion, we have John chapter 20, and we are looking at verse 1 to verse 21. The story that has been read to us has three sequential events. The first one you see is the empty tomb up to verse 9. The second one that you see is that Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene, verse 10 to verse 18. And the third one that you see is that Jesus now appears to all the disciples, verse 19 to verse 21. And as we look at the subject, giving the spirit and peace, we ask the question, what can give peace in the difficult circumstances? What is it that can still make us have some hope when the world is beating us around? What is it that can give us hope in the times of despair, in times of distress, in times of discouragement, in times of difficulty? And I see three things, wonderful people of God. Number one is that when we come to those times of discouragement, there is the power of God. You find that between verse 1 and verse number 9. The power of God that we need to be reminded of. Number two is you see the proximity of God, which essentially is a fact that God is not too far. Verse 10 to verse 18. And number three, we see the promise of God fulfilled. And the promise of God fulfilled is that earlier on Jesus had been talking about the promise. And that promise ultimately is the promise of the Holy Spirit. Let us look at the power of God. Verse 1 to verse number 9. Well, when we think of power, it is primarily the ability to do something. And sometimes the greater the thing to be done in our minds, in our limited understanding, the greater the power. Something that is impossible. Something that we can do. Something that is done. Something that is done without any limitation. When that happens, you can say and we can say, I see the power. Now, when you come to verse number 1, chapter 20, the Bible says that early in the morning, I don't know why they were going early in the morning, the Bible says early in the morning, the first day of the week, 
while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb, the tomb where Jesus had been laid. And she saw that the stone had been moved from the entrance. And all that she could think about is that they have taken my Lord. Where have they taken my Lord? The stone had been removed. Verse 2. She came running to Peter and the other disciples in verse 2, the Bible says. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one that Jesus loved, perhaps John, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have put him. So it's almost like death was not enough, but even the body must have been taken a time of discouragement, a time of despair. And they all went to the tomb, verse 3 and verse 4. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And the Bible says that he bent over and looked in at the stripes of linen lying there, but did not go in. He bent over, looked in at the stripes of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter also, who was behind him, arrived and went right inside the tomb. And he saw the stripes of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside and he saw and he believed that indeed Jesus was no more. They still did not understand what was happening, we are told, from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. What you see here is that they have gone hoping to find and to see the body, and the body is no more. So what you see is the power of God displayed over death, and Jesus had risen from the dead, and that's why we talk about the resurrection Sunday. Jesus overcame death. Death is one of those phenomenon that man is helpless over. With all interventions in the scientific world, even technology, Man is still helpless when it comes to death. And what we see here is that God has the power that can defy the ordinary nature. God is omnipotent in a world full of chaos and uncertainty. It is easy to feel overwhelmed by our weaknesses and our powerlessness. But there is one source of strength that never fails, and that indeed is God's power. So we see the power of God manifest, but when the authorities thought that they had dealt Jesus Christ the final blow, and that they had even closed the tomb very tightly, when the disciples go, they find the tomb open, and Jesus is not there anymore. God had displayed his power over death by raising Jesus Christ from the dead. And I want us to know that that power that was is the power that is today and is the power that will be forever. That power of God is at work even in our lives today. And so we are told in Acts chapter 2 verse 24, but God raised him from the dead freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Jesus overcame the power of death. For we know, Romans chapter 6 verse 9 says, for we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. It is this power that makes him to be the savior of the world. A little boy was traveling by plane to visit his 
grandparents. And he sat next to a, a seminary professor. And this boy was reading his Sunday school take, take home paper when the professor thought that he would make some fun with this boy. And so this seminary professor asked, Young man, said the professor, if you can tell me something God can do, then I will give you a nice shiny apple. And the little boy thought for a while, and he told this professor, Oh, if you tell me or if you show me what God cannot do, then I will give you a basket full of apples. And I want to tell us here today that with our God, there is nothing that is impossible. Our God has power over death. Our God has power over circumstances. Our God has power over chaos. Our God has power over the world. And that brings peace and the peace of God. Oh, when you come to Psalms, number 147, verse 4 to 5, the Bible says that he determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in his power. His understanding is beyond measure. This power of God is the one that created the world. This power of God is the one that sustains the world. This power of God is the one that defies the laws of nature so that the things that can be said are impossible with man can never be impossible with God. And therefore, God displays his power in the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, we celebrate today the resurrection Sunday. Remember, it was in the context of confusion it was in the context of discouragement. It was in the context of distress. And God comes there and assures them that he's still alive. For that which they thought had put him down, he now overcame. And death is probably just one of those. I want to emphasize it for us here today. That over all the circumstances we face, some we may be facing now and today. Our God still has power. And I believe that God may want to visit with us here today. I believe that God may want to touch us here today. I believe that God may want to give someone a breakthrough here today, displaying his power, that power that overcame death, and that power that overcomes all the circumstances and all the challenges and all the discouragements that we may face today. For that peace to be realized, that peace that we are talking about, number one, yes, the power of God. Number two is the proximity of God. In fact, let me just read another verse to just show us that power of God. Where, in verse 19, when you go to verse 19 there, the, the, the Bible says that even when they were seated, the, the doors were closed because maybe they were fearing. Suddenly Jesus just walks in through the walls, through the doors that are closed, which basically means there is nothing that can hold him back. He has all the power to go against the conventional thinking of man. Number two, the proximity of God. Verse 10, the Bible says, then the disciples went back to their homes. Remember that experience of the tomb. But Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And number one, you see that there were two angels, two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. Then the two angels asked her, woman, why are you crying? She said, they have taken my Lord away, she said. 
and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, Jesus said, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Thinking he was a gardener, she said, sir, you have carried him away. Tell me where you have put him and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And perhaps that voice was now too familiar. She turned toward him and even cried in Aramaic, saying, Raboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father, to my God, and your God. And Mary Magdalene then went to the disciples. Now, the disciples went back, as that scripture says. Mary stood outside. The angels, which to a large extent is also a representation of God, were just there, and that is a proximity. God is always within reach. Remember, Mary was crying. When we reach out to him, God is always within reach. God is omnipresent. But we need to call out. And you see that in the presence of the angels. The angels were empathetic. So that in her distress, they were feeling with her. Our God feels with us. Our God is not just near, but he understands and he feels with us whatever we are going through. She turned around and then saw Jesus. And Jesus appeared then to all the disciples, if you go to verse number 19. Of course, it says, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands, and the disciples were overjoyed. The presence and the proximity of Jesus makes a difference. These were the disciples that were gloomy. These were the disciples that were perhaps who were crying. But you can see that that proximity, that presence of Jesus, that presence of God makes a difference in their lives. And therefore, they were overjoyed. I don't know where you are today. The same God who was present is always next to us in all the situations and all the circumstances of our lives. And after he had said this, he showed them his hands. And this peace that we are talking about, he said, peace be with you. And they were overjoyed. At our point of need, God is within reach. In the midst of chaos and confusion, Jesus is still saying, peace be with you, and I am with you. Jesus understands. You know, when angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and told her that she will have a son, in the book of Matthew chapter 1, she will give birth to a son, verse 21, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with a child and will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, meaning God with us. And if God is with us, he has gone through what we have gone through. If God is with us, he has walked where we have walked. If God is with us, he understands your pain just the same way he was understanding the pain of the disciples. I believe it's Don Moen that writes a song and sings. He walked where I walk. He stood where I stand. He felt what I feel. He understands. He knows my frailty, shares my humanity, tempted in every way. 
yet without sin. One of a hated race, stung by the prejudice, suffering injustice, yet he forgives. God with us, so close to us, Emmanuel. Our God is with us. In the times of pain, God is with us. In the times of grief, like the disciples, God is with us. He's just within reach. In the times of chaos, God is close. Proximity of God. All we need to do is to call out to God. I don't know where you are today. I don't know your circumstances today. But one message that I bring to us is that God is here. God is with us. God understands. And he's not only understanding, but he's a powerful God who is able to overcome all the rules of nature and to intervene into the affairs of man. May he intervene for you wherever you are today. May he intervene in your circumstances. May you see his power displayed in your unique situations. Point number three. The promise of God fulfilled. Verse 19 to 23. And this promise of God is primarily the Holy Spirit, the third person of Trinity. We are told that on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and told them, peace be with you. After he said this, that's verse 20, he showed them his hands and the disciples were overjoyed, turning their pain into almost joy when they saw the Lord. And verse number 21 says, again Jesus said to them, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed into them and said, what? Receive the Holy Spirit. And then a technical verse there, we'll try to explain it. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. We start seeing the fulfillment of the promise of the Holy Spirit. And there are several verses earlier on that Jesus talked about. This greater outpouring, you see it in the book of Acts. And you can see the signs of, and wonders that followed the apostles and the disciples. So that even Peter, that at some point was timid, before a slave girl, and denied Jesus Christ, after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, was able to face the multitude and the authorities because there is a promise that was fulfilled and this is the beginning of that fulfillment. So for example, the promise, you start reading from it from John chapter 7, verse 37. Jesus says that on the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and, his, and said in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures have said, streams of living water shall flow from within him. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later. You can see that? were later. That later, you start seeing it in this John chapter 20. They were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. And being glorified primarily means that he was now risen from the dead. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit to a larger extent and to a greater scale, as I've said, is then realized in the book of Acts. The Holy Spirit comes as an enabler. The Holy Spirit 
come to make things or even to make it possible for us to live for God. Making it possible for us to serve God. Making it possible for us even to be witness. Look at another promise, John chapter 14. And it says, if you love me, you will obey what I command. Verse 16. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. The spirit of the truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. That will be points to this beginning of John chapter 20. And I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Chapter 16 verse 12. I have much more to say to you. More than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all things. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. And we see that promise being fulfilled. So that when the Holy Spirit comes, that which God asks us to do, it is possible because an enabler has come. The comforter has come in the times of difficulty. Even the counselor has come. And he comes in his great power also to intervene in the affairs of human beings. Now, I talked about verse 23. Now, it says, if you forgive any one his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Well, Jesus was leaving the earth physically, but promised God will be with the disciples in the person of the Holy Spirit living in them. I want us to take note of that. Secondly, as they proclaimed the gospel, they could honestly tell people who believed in that message that their sins were forgiven. So that they are being saying that you are forgiven is because those people have believed first. So they're just emphasizing that which has happened because of the knowledge that they've been given. So as they proclaimed the gospel, they could honestly tell people who believed in the message that their sins were forgiven. And they could also honestly tell people that did not believe in the message that their sins were not forgiven and that they stand to be condemned. For again, we are told in John chapter 3, verse 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains in him. So their emphasis here is if you believe, then they can tell you, yes, so and so you believe, your sins are forgiven. If you don't believe, then they can tell you, you don't believe in Jesus then your sins are not forgiven. And all that is only possible because it's the Holy Spirit that brings conviction. Wonderful people of God. In the midst of the chaos that the disciples were facing, there can be a peace. And that peace comes through the realization, worship him, please be coming, can be seen in the Realization of the power of God. That peace can be seen because of the proximity. God is near. He is an omnipresent God. He can be with us in our circumstances. That peace can be seen when the promise of the Holy Spirit is indeed fulfilled. There are times and seasons in life when we can be overwhelmed. 
Sometimes death, like we have seen amongst the disciples, can overwhelm us. Sometimes it can be sickness. Sometimes it can be relationships. Sometimes the economy that is not doing so well. Sometimes businesses that are not doing well. Sometimes family dynamics. In those times, we need to know the peace of God that transcends all understanding. And for us to realize that peace of God, we must realize and we must be aware and we must be convinced that God has power. We must be convinced of the proximity of God. We must be convinced of the promise of God, the promise of the Holy Spirit. Jesus came in power to redeem the world. Jesus came in his power to be in the world. Jesus left us behind with the promise. The promise of the Holy Spirit. And that is why we talk of a resurrection Sunday. Which is a victorious Sunday. And if we believe in him, victory can be yours. And so there is a song that says, oh, oh, oh. Victory belongs to Jesus. Victory belongs to him. Oh, 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 oh. Victory belongs to Jesus. Victory belongs to him. that says there is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain. There is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain. I've just told us worship him, help me to sing that song. I've just told us that the disciples they were at that point of confusion that point of giving up this Jesus that they had depended on, that they had given their all, suddenly seemed to have been no more. And suddenly, as they go to the tomb on a day like this, the power of God is unleashed. The power of God is unleashed. The power of God is unleashed. of Jesus there is power in the name of Jesus there is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain break every chain break every chain to break every chain Every chain, break every chain. There is power, there is power in the name of Jesus. There is power, there is power in the name of Jesus. There is power, there is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain.
that power was seen at the resurrection. That power is alive today. Could it be that you are here and you desire to see this resurrection power come through for you and meet you at your very point of need. In whatever circumstances, for the disciples, it was at their lowest moment when death faced them. That can be true in all our circumstances. And as I go to sit, and if you are there, as we sing, there is power in the name of Jesus. Do you want to see him in his power? Because he's close. Let me ask you just to stand to your feet as we pray.